Welcome back to the Illumination Lectures. And today we're going to discuss the Edessan monarchy and their many links to the biblical story. And this will lead us on in the next lecture to the discovery of the biblical Jesus in the historical record. And again, this is taken from my book, um, Jesus, King of Edessa, which is a 600-page opus that transforms gospel history into real history. No bells and spells, just reason and rationality. Now, we saw in the last lecture that Queen Helena of uh, Adiabeni was actually Queen Helena of Edessa. So the influential city of Adiabeni that Josephus, uh, Josephus Flavius is always talking about, and nobody can find in the archaeology of uh, Mesopotamia, was actually the city of Edessa, which lies just beyond the Euphrates. It's in um, modern Anatolia, and here, and here it is. This is Edessa, modern San Lerfa. And according to the... Um, Gnostic Gospels, which, you know, we will go through this in later lectures, this was the first Christian city in the world. But unfortunately, now there are no practicing Christians left in this city, and all of its churches have been turned into mosques. And we find something similar just to the east at Amida, which is modern Diyarbakir, which lies, it just lies on the banks uh, of the Tigris. Uh, and it's one of the first, one of the few towns that still retains its entire curtain wall, so it's, it's well worth visiting as a tourist. And the tourist guide will say that there are 12 churches remaining within the um, walls of the old city, but it neglects to say that 10 of them have been burned down in recent years. And this is one of the few remaining churches where the, um, the congregation, incidentally, still speak Aramaic, which is the original language of Jesus and his disciples. And, um, oh yes, as an interesting aside, this is also uh, at Edessa. I'm not sure if you recognize this, but this is Gobekli Tepe, which is supposedly the uh, oldest temple in the world. And it lies just outside Edessa. So the um, fictitious Adiabeni that Josephus is always talking about is the real Edessa. And this is the first time this has ever been correctly identified since the era of the Knights Templar. And we will see evidence later that the Knights Templar also knew of this conflation between these two uh, towns or cities. So viewers are getting privileged information here. You will not get this level of illumination from any modern history book, because modern historians simply do not understand this story and this history. So where did the Edessan monarchy come from? Let's have a quick look at its origins. Um, as I said previously, they were descended from Queen Theomusa Aurania. Uh, who married into the royal line of Parthia. So the Edessan kings were half Greco-Egyptian and half Persio-Parthian. And um, here they are. This is um, Queen Theomusa on the right and uh, Phratases on the left. And they were both kicked out of Parthia in AD 4 and settled somewhere in Syria. And now we know that that place was actually Edessa. And we know this because Moses of Korin, who is a Syriac chronicler, and he says that the ancestors of King Agbarus of Edessa were Armenian kings, who he calls Artashis, the line of Artashis kings, who moved their capital city from Nisibis to Edessa. So Moses of Korin is being rather disingenuous here because they are not Armenian kings at all because Artashis is simply a mispronunciation of Arsasis, which is the generic name for all of the Parthian kings. So the ancestors of King Agbaras of Edessa were the Arsasis royal line of Parthia, which is just what 
I have said previously, and obviously in the books that underpin these videos, that King Agbaras was simply a new name for King Phratasis Arsasis, the King of Parthia. And here he is again, this is Phratasis, uh, or King Agbaras as he became known. And if these different names seem troubling to this research, do remember that kings had multiple titles in these eras. And so this particular king was called, um, on various occasions, he was called Phratasis, um, which means the, uh, the son of King Phratis, Monobazus, the only king, uh, Abgarus, which means the king of the exiles, and Izates, which is said to mean angel, but I think it's more likely to mean strong horse. And if that seems unlikely, well, strong horse, uh, when translated into Greek, uh, is Hippocrates. So perhaps we should look a little more closely at this Parthian Empire, the empire that spawned this smaller Edessan principality. Well, following the campaigns of Alexander the Great in uh, 330 BC, all of present Egypt, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, they were all Greek. And they spoke Greek and they adopted a lot of Greek culture. Uh, and this is what became known as the Seleucid Empire. But there was a small region it was out towards the northeast of Iran, around the Caspian Sea, into modern Turkmenistan, which was inhabited by the Parthi. And their ruler was Arsaces I, the first of these Arsaces kings. And this became known as Parthia. And in about 240 BC, Parthia started to expand into the Seleucid Empire. And it slowly expanded and expanded until all the way through to the 50s BC, they had taken over nearly all of Seleucia. And at that time, Rome thought they had gone far enough. And so they sent an army under Crassus to stop their westward advance. Uh, but the Roman army was defeated at Carre, uh, mostly by the treachery of the Ar uh, Armenians, who had been the allies of Rome, but uh, turned at the last minute and attacked the Romans. And um, Kare is, is Haran. And this is Haran, and it lies just to the south of Edessa. It's about 25 kilometers to the south of Edessa. And this again is another of these old walled cities, but there is nothing really left of Haran. This is about the uh, only part of Haran that is still standing. So the Parthians expanded into Syria after 50 BC, uh, but Rome eventually drove them back out of Syria. Uh, but Mark Antony lost a major battle at uh, Prasper um, against the Parthians and had to withdraw back to Syria. Then we had a, um, a changing of the guard. There was a change of leaders on both sides. And Octavian became the emperor of Rome. And Phraates IV became the king of Parthia. And they called a truce. And this is when uh, Theomusa Orania was sent to Parthia as a diplomatic bride uh, by Octavian, Augustus, uh, to become the wife of King Phraates IV. And she then became the um, queen of Parthia. But as we've seen in a previous lecture, she then poisoned her husband in 2 BC and became the sole queen of Parthia, but was pushed out of Parthia in AD 4. And this was the origins of the um, nativity scene uh, from the biblical gospels. Anyway, here is um, Phraates IV. And uh, this is a fairly traditional image of all of the Parthian kings, but you might be able to see just on his forehead there, he has a wart on his forehead. And this is a different uh, image of the same king. And this image looks a little different because it's from a different mint. But note, he still has a wart on his forehead. And this wart became the symbol of the Parthian royalty through many generations after this time. 
And some historians have said that this is a, a genetic defect. But would a genetic defect give the same blister in the same location throughout many generations? No, that's, that's highly unlikely. And this wart has to be really symbolic of something. And the obvious uh, analogy has to be with the Indian bindi. And here is a, an Indian actress wearing a red bindi on her forehead. And the bindi is said to be, um, well, it's said to be many things, but it's said to be the third eye and a symbol of creation and wisdom. And it's, um, it's not portrayed just on women, but it's also to be found on, on the Buddha as well. And so it must indicate something rather more profound. So what is the true symbolism of this complex and confusing bindi? Well, it seems to have been the equivalent of the Greco-Egyptian concept of the navel of the universe. And so it's likely to be the equivalent of the Egyptian primeval mound, which became the Benben stone, the Omphalos, the navel of the universe, uh, which eventually became the um, sacred stone of Judaism and Christianity. Um, and we shall talk about this sacred stone more in, in, in later lectures. So it's possible that this, this wart and this bindi are symbolic of this sacred stone, which was taken to the East by Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC, and it ended up in Parthia, which may be how uh, this symbolism arrived into Parthia. And this is what the original stone looks like. This is the, um, this is the Omphalos of Delphi in Greece. Uh, and as you can see, it's a small conical stone, rather similar to the um, Parthian wart. Uh, this is not the real uh, Omphalos, of course. This is simply a copy. Uh, the original was a meteorite, and it, it has been lost from history. Uh, probably in about the 3rd century AD, it becomes lost to history. And so it, it seems likely, and we'll see more evidence for this later, that the kings of Parthia wore the, um, the wart, or the bindi, to show they had been initiated into the mysteries of this particular sacred stone. And this becomes important again uh, later in this research because uh, this sacred stone was not only important in early Christianity, it was also well known within Arthurian legend. In, and uh, in Arthurian legend, it was actually called the Holy Grail. And we'll talk about that in a later lecture. So as I said earlier, Phratices was kicked out of Parthia in AD 4 with his mother Theomusa Aurania, and these were the ancestors of King Agbarus of Edessa. So King Agbarus was simply a new name for King Phratices. But no modern historian has ever discovered this because they are, I think they are too afraid to critically analyze these texts. And they've often said to me, where are your references for this claim? To which the reply has to be, there are none, because this is original research. And yet this, this lies outside the experience of modern historians who cannot imagine original thinking or original research. They seem to be only able to copy and quote other historians, and so history itself has ossified and stuck into a 19th or 20th century time warp. If you quote your predecessors, you get full marks. If you think for yourself, you go to the bottom of the class. But their rather naive history of this region never really made any sense. They had no evidence that Adiabeni was Erbil, which is what it was said to be. And they had no evidence of the royal family there and no evidence that the leaders of the Jewish revolt came from that region. And remember that Josephus Flavius says the leaders of the Jewish revolt came from Adiabeni. But if you derive a new cogent theory for this history, uh, historians will say you are wrong and partly deranged, despite the fact that Syriac historians clearly record 
that Queen Helena of Adiabene was Queen Helena of Edessa, and therefore Adiabene is very likely to have been Edessa. Only uh, Professor Robert Eisenman has half agreed with me, and he observes that uh, in Syriac traditions, Helen was King Agbar's wife. And he also notes that the Edessan kings used the title Izatis, which is a, a royal title for the Adiabene monarchy. But even Professor Eisenman will not follow this logic through to its obvious conclusion. And yet this, this new theory makes a great deal of, uh, of sense, as we shall see. And I liken my new research to a jigsaw puzzle. Because if this theory was wrong, you would be trying to force all of the pieces to fit together, and most of them would not fit, and they certainly wouldn't form a clear picture. Only if this theory is true will all of the pieces fit together neatly, and a picture will emerge. And this is exactly what's happened in this case. All of the pieces have fitted together. Even the Hukok mosaic, which was discovered well after these books were written, fits in perfectly to this particular puzzle. So why are historians so resistant to this new theory that Adiabene is Edessa? Why do they think it's so important that they will resist this suggestion with such um, tenacity? Well, I think it's because of the religious ramifications of this theory. Namely, that many links appear with a biblical story. So what are those links? Well, the first is contained in the cryptic title Locust, which appears throughout these texts. And as we saw in a previous lecture, the leaders of the Jewish revolt were called Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, a locust and a son of a locust. And uh, here is King Kamza, the leader of the Jewish revolt, who we now know is King Monobazus of, Aban of Adiabene, who is in reality uh, a king of Edessa. So here we have the earliest mosaic of an Edessan king. So please look at my talk on the Hokok mosaic, which explains this particular mosaic in much more detail. But in short, King Kamza of Edessa uh, is here, he is offering a sacrificial calf from Emperor Nero to the Jerusalem priesthood in order to start the um, Jewish revolt. However, he's not really called King Kamza, of course. That's just a carping hypochorism, which means locust. And so the Edessan monarchies are again being called locusts. And this is not the only occasion that, th that this has happened, because if you look at the Roman chronicles, they call the uh, kings of Adiabene Arabs. And I don't think this is because they came from the Arabias, because, because they do not. They actually came from Mesopotamia. No, the Romans were calling them Arabs, because in Aramaic, Araba means locust. So again, the Adiabene Edessans were being called locusts. And then we come to a similar disparaging title in the Gospel accounts. And this is where we start to see the many links with the Gospel stories. And Acts of the Apostles says, Agabus prophesied that there would be a great famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which was sent to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And here is the uh, biblical uh, Agabus from Acts of the Apostles, foretelling the great famine of Judea. So who was this prophet called Agabus? The prophet who forecast the great famine under Claudius, which uh, most historians think happened in AD 47. 
This was the great famine that Queen Helena sent relief money to alleviate. And Josephus Flavius mentions this very same event. So Josephus Flavius says, King Izates of Adiabene made great preparations for Queen Helena's mission and gave her a great deal of money. And she went down to Jerusalem. A famine did oppress them at this time and many, many people died for want of food. Queen Helena sent some of her servants to Alexandria with money to buy a great deal of corn and she distributed food to those in need and left a most excellent memorial of this benefaction. Interesting. So in Acts of the Apostles, it was Agabus who gave famine relief money to Judea in the time of Claudius. And in Josephus, it was Helena and Abgarus who gave famine relief money to Judea in the time of Claudius. So it is highly likely that the Agabus in Acts of the Apostles was King Abgarus of Edessa, the husband of Queen Helena. And note the two pronunciations here, Abgarus and Agabus, and it's very easy to confuse the two. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, is that a mispronunciation or a hypochorism, a nickname? Well, Professor Robert Eisenman agrees that these two people are the same, but he thinks the change in name is simply a mispronunciation. And he says the pronunciation Agbarus or Abgarus depends on which source one is drawing upon. Greek or Syriac. According to Eusebius, the Agbar or Abgar in question, I prefer to use the former because of its clear connection to Agabus in Acts of the Apostles, was actually called Agbar Uchama. So Professor Eisenman thinks the two pronunciations are interchangeable. One is Aramaic, the other is Greek but they are not. In reality, one of them is a derogatory nickname because in the Gospel Greek, uh, Agabus means locust. So in four different texts, in the Roman record, in the Talmud, in the works of Josephus and Acts of the Apostles, the Edessan monarchy are being called locusts. So why is that? Well, I think it is derogatory pasha. Using events of the past and comparing them with current events. And in this case, the Talmudic rabbis were looking at the events of the Exodus, the biblical Exodus uh, from the Torah, where a plague of locusts came out of the East and devastated Egypt, resulting in the exile of the Israelites uh, from out of Egypt uh, to Israel. And the Torah says of this event, Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind, and the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts covered the face of the whole earth, so the land was darkened, and they did eat every plant of the land of Egypt. That was one of the ten plagues. However, by using Pesha, traditional Talmudic Pesha, we could say exactly the same thing happened in the first century. The Edessan royal family came out of the east, out of Babylon, started a war in Judea that resulted in the destruction of Judea and the exile of nearly all of the Jews. So the Pesha comparison works on all levels. The Edessan monarchy were no better than a plague of locusts from the east, blown to Judea on the hot easterly winds. And I think this carping uh, hypochorism was coined by Josephus Flavius, the quicksilver quilled wordsmith of first century Judea. But it was quickly adopted by the Romans and Talmudic scribes who loved to um, denigrate their political enemies. But 
But did you notice something here about that quote from Acts of the Apostles? This is why you have to read these verses carefully with a critical eye, because it's very easy to miss these small details. Because the famine relief was taken from Edessa to Jerusalem by Saul, St. Paul and Barnabas, the biblical Saul and Barnabas. Therefore, Saul and Barnabas were ambassadors of the Edessa monarchy. And this is why nobody will link Adiabeni with Edessa, uh, because we are, we are falling down a deep rabbit hole here into a parallel historical universe, and we have no idea where this particular hole will lead us. Remember that Saul, St. Paul, was the major chronicler of gospel events. He wrote all of the epistles, and he had a a strong hand in Luke and Acts. And as we saw in a previous lecture, Saul was Josephus Flavius. And so this conflated Saul Josephus wrote the entire history of the Israelites and the entire history of first century Judea. So why does Saul Josephus not mention uh, that he himself was the Edessan ambassador to Jerusalem? And why has no other historian or modern historian since that time ever mentioned it? Well, that is because this this particular conflation changes everything. It means that the Antioch mentioned in Acts of the Apostles was actually Antioch Edessa, not Antioch Orontes. So the the, the city in which the disciples all met was Edessa, the capital city of King Agbaras of Edessa. And here are those two locations. Uh, On the left you will see Antioch Arontz, which is where traditionally um, theologians and historians will say that the disciples met. And on the right is Antioch Edessa. Now they might look very close physically, but Politically and historically, they are, they are miles apart because it changes the whole of the story. It means that Edessa uh, was central to the gospel story. This is where the disciples met. This is where Saul was an ambassador. And this was the city that was sending uh, monetary aid for famine relief to Judea in AD 47. But Edessa has been deleted from history. As we said before, just do a a computer search of the works of Josephus and it'll come up after a while and it'll say, nothing found. Because Josephus was told to delete Edessa from history by Emperor Vespasian. And so Edessa was deleted from every chronicle. It was deleted from the works of Josephus, from the Roman Chronicles, from the Talmud, and from the Gospels. Because Edessa was urbis non grata, it was the city that could never be named. And we'll see why Vespasian hated Edessa in the next lecture. But the later Catholic Church went along with this deceit because Edessa was the main centre of Gospel history. That is why Saul Josephus was an ambassador to the Edessan royal family, and that had to be covered up. The last thing the church wanted you to know is that the biblical Jesus came from Edessa, that he was a real king with a real palace and real coins, and that he was the leader of the Jewish revolt. And so the Catholic Church has continued this centuries-old cover-up, a cover-up that has lasted until this very day, until this hoary old conundrum was deciphered and exposed by myself, Ralph Ellis. So I hope you've enjoyed this illumination lecture and can join us again next time when we will see who the biblical Jesus really was in the historical record.